Um, please welcome uh, James Gardner. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about the delay there. It's a very old Mac. Um, after Michael's uh, talk there, um, part of me is tempted to just go what he said uh, and go away. Um, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll continue. Um, the call for submissions for this conference said that informal presentation styles were welcome, and I'm going to take that as its word. Uh, this is certainly an informal presentation, partly because I'm lazy, but also because I think any discussion of a work in progress, which is part of what I'm going to do, is likely to be contingent and provisional. It's a work in progress, after all. So the title of uh, the, the paper is Work in Progress, Flow and the Observer Effect. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and I'm going to offer a very personal take on some of the things I think I might be doing when I'm composing using a recently completed piece and one in progress as examples. Both of the compositions I'm talking about here are relatively conventional <coughs> and are for unamplified acoustic instruments, and both use an extended form of traditional Western art music notation. I'm, I'm aware that some of the terms I'm going to be using, like Western art music, are highly contestable, uh, but in the interests of brevity, I'm just going to take them as read. <laughs> and uh, one of the questions, uh, you know, Eno is always good for a quote, uh, why am I doing this? Why the fuck am I doing this? The question that always precedes something worthwhile. And then something that came to me in an email from the uh, com composer uh, F. Richard Moore recently, uh, talking about John Pierce, who, amongst other things, was the co-father of the geosynchronous satellite, as you can see there, and also came up with the word transistor. Um, he used to say that what he was sure he was doing research only when he felt he really didn't know what he was doing. Research, we don't know what's going to... We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so I'm heartened by these first two quotes because they suggest that whatever it is that I'm doing when I'm composing, it's certainly worthwhile and research. My PPRFs are up for grabs. <laughs> um, so the where am I, that's another aspect of this. Where am I going? And another quote from Feldman here. Um, the whole idea is not to write a good piece. The whole idea is to get lost and then come out, you know, come out of it alive. There are a lot of times I'm totally lost. It's very upsetting. <laughs> so that's where I'm starting from. I start at this sort of cloud of unknowing through which I seem to glimpse what the piece might be. But that suggests that the piece already exists. And of course what I'm actually doing is constructing it, inter interacting with it. But it, nevertheless, there's often a sense however vague, that the piece does already exist and step by step it's uncovered. And we could discuss what's meant by the piece until the cows come home, of course, but I won't get distracted by the ontology of music, a work of music. I'll leave that to Lydia Gurr and people like that. Um, and often at the beginning of a piece, it, I think it may be constructive to approach it with the spirit of a via negativa, by negation. In other words, to think about what the piece isn't what it isn't going to be, what I'm not going to do in this piece, as much as what I am going to do and what it might be. And I think that the necessity of becoming lost or feeling disorientated, however uncomfortable it might be, is actually quite important to the nature of coming up with potentially something new. I feel like I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here. I think, I think a lot of you know all this stuff already. Uh, this is a more traditional kind of view from a composer whose music I don't feel any particular... Um, resonant most of the time. Uh, Benjamin Britten, composing is like driving down a foggy road towards a house. Slowly you see more details of the house, the colour of the slates and bricks, the shape of the windows, the notes of the bricks and mortar of the house. Um, again, that presupposes that the thing already exists, that we're not entering into some kind of creative dialogue with whatever the it is at any given moment. Um, and I'm not sure I, I, that's how it sort of feels to me most of the time. Okay, so the piece um, I completed recently is called Nakashima Bull, and it's a piece for bassoon and string trio that I finished earlier this year. Um, and the starting point, in one sense, Mike was talking about you have a sort of at least some kind of hook to hang something on at the beginning, um, and I think that's very true. 
And for me, uh, there were a couple of starting points for this piece, Nakashima Bull. Uh, one is simply the instrumentation. For me, the instrumentation is very important. What are the instruments I'm writing for? They already have a, a, um, a, a selection of possibilities that you may or may not exploit in some way or another. So that's one given, if you like. Uh, but the other was the work of the Japanese-American woodworker and furniture maker George Nakashima, um, who often used burls in his work. A burl is basically like a kind of um, a tree tumour. And when you slice them, you will have seen this as, I think, a walnut. Um, you get these fantastic patterns inside, and he uses that. Uh, we used to use this as part of his furniture making and would go with the grain and, you know, res as he would sort of put it, respect the, the, what the wood is telling him. That was his way of, of going about it. And I was actually alerted to his work by my analyst, Dale Dodd, who sadly died um, quite suddenly not long after I started work on this piece. So he alerted me to this uh, uh, woodworker and I already had the instrumentation of string trio and bassoon, which had this kind of woody quality to me in my head. And so it seemed a natural fit that maybe, okay, I can do something that, to do with wood. And again, that's a, the sort of vague mimesis of, of, of okay, wood, burl, okay, knottiness, what can I do with that? What does that mean? And as Mike says, it's not a question of a depiction of a specific piece of wood or anything like that. It's just something for me to kind of refer to. How can I, or what does that mean? Knotty, how do I do knotty in music? And then you sort of forget about it as the piece progresses because you get more involved in specific musical problems, I suspect. Um, so that woodiness listening to the grain of the wood led me to think about the woodiness of an instrument and start from there so the piece uses quite a lot of colonia trato obvious kind of woody grainy and slightly unpredictable quality of that and following that it dictated the, no the notion of a partly uh, this sort of partly anthropomorphized into musical material and entering into a relationship or dialogue with it which i'll develop a little bit later, this notion of having something that you then interact with, something outside yourself that you're working with. Again, this is a question of now just mark that and, and move on. So I decided early, for instance, in the piece um, on some other givens that stemmed from the a consideration of the musical instruments involved. So simple things like I tune the cello fourth, fourth string down a tone to B-flat one so it could play in unison with the bottom note of the bassoon. Simple stuff like that. In fact, as it turned out, I actually only did that twice in the piece. I thought it was going to be an important thing, but in the course of the piece, you forget about it, and it's like, oh, oh yeah, that thing. Oh, God, I've only done it twice. Oh, well, who cares? Never mind. It's not what the piece is about. It was just a, a sort of thing to get me going. Um, so as, start, as far as starting points were concerned, that was about it. The rest was a sort of seemingly aimless process guided by just those few initial conditions. And I want to get just concrete for a moment, some of those initial conditions. Uh, this, I won't go into the details of this, but this is basically uh, an automated version of something I used to do by hand, which is basically to generate uh, sequences of intervals. Uh, which slowly morph. So we, basically we have a slowly mutating contour, and the contour slowly changes. It's as simple as that. Um, and fortunately, my very clever brother-in-law, uh, Nigel Keem, who, who works for SpaceX, used to work for Microsoft, um, automated this into a, an Excel spreadsheet um, for me. And we came up with some other constraints and things that I wanted. He, it took him about two hours to put this thing together. It's extraordinary. Uh, it, take, it would take me weeks to try and think out even an algorithm of what it was I was doing on paper to tell him how to do it. Anyway, he got it, he grokked it in about two hours. Um, so I'm not going to get distracted by this, but this is a part of the kind of mechanics of what's going on to generate some of the material. And what, again, we could, we could have a whole conference on what, what material means. Uh, it's a very vague term that we all use as if everybody knows what we're talking about. I'm not sure we really do. Um, so this stuff uh, is part of the material of the piece, um, but only in the sense, and I think of what's going on here, is 
generating a kind of cloth or fabric. What you do with that is entirely up to you, but it does mean that the material or the cloth has a particular flavour or pattern. That's all it is. And it doesn't say anything about instrumentation, pit, well, a little bit about register. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about anything rhythmic or how you're going to combine these or layer these things. It's just a way of spitting out some, some coherent intervallic sequences. That's all it is. Um, and so these are sort of my initial conditions. And on the one hand, there's this sort of quasi-mystical seeking after something that's vaguely out there. On the other hand, there's the concrete materiality of the instruments themselves, what they can do, the, the interaction with the notation, stuff like this, um, which is not very zen. Um, these are sort of things that uh, what Zanakis calls outside time structures away. They don't actually have any... Uh, ramifications directly within the piece. They're just something that you can refer to, although actually I mean, it's sequential, so there is a, there is a temporal aspect, but it's, it's very vague. Okay, I want to come back to the, the notion, um, and probably Michael is very familiar with this person here, Mihai Chiksen Mihai, um, who produces a lot of, has produced a lot of work on the notion of creativity with these rather sort of tacky, self-help, slightly airport self-help book covers um, and a lot of it is about a kind of self-improvement how to achieve happiness and of course we know thanks to Slavoj Žižek that uh, being happy as a creative artist is not necessarily a, a desirable state one has to have some anxiety you know what Martha Graham called blessed unrest of course um, but nevertheless, and there is not a lot to say about musical creativity really it's more to do with this, the whole idea of flow being in the zone in real time, particularly. Um, so I t I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by some of this stuff, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, he does quote a composer in this, an unnamed composer, who says, you are in an ecstatic state to such a point that you feel as though you almost don't exist, have experienced this time and time again. My hand seems devoid of itself. This is very much about the kind of actual handwriting of music in this particular instance. And I have nothing to do with what is happening. I just, w just oh, sit there watching it in a state of awe and wonderment, and the music just flows out of itself. Now, that's a very romantic kind of description of a kind of rapturous, ecstatic state. Ecstatic in the more modern sense, not the an initial st uh, idea of standing beside yourself, which is actually what I feel more about. Um, that this stuff just flows. Well, does that happen for me? Well, it feels like that sometimes, but not very often. And more often, it's to do with setting up something with which, with, with it, with which I then interact. So we could say this is a sort of dialectic or dialogic thing. I have to have something outside of me which, which, I, which I feel I'm grappling with. I don't actually feel, as um, Stravinsky rather disingenuously, I think, said about I am the vessel through which Lissacre passed. You know, maybe for a, for a little bit but not, not most of the time. Most of the time it's just sort of a kind of hard work. But there are times when one feels the piece has kind of run away from oneself, like a sort of um, an errant toddler zooming off into a particular um, place that we don't necessarily want them to go. Uh, and then you decide to go with that or not. Okay. So, yeah, do I feel something like flow in composition? Well, yes but not most of the time. Most of the time is piecemeal, stopping, toing and froing, starting again. And this is where the idea of the observer effect comes in. I think Michael kind of alluded to it a little bit. What does it mean to be talking about a piece that I'm still working on, and does that affect the piece? Does the preparation of talking here today, have, has that affected the work on the piece? I think the answer is yes, but probably not as much as I thought it was going to when I thought this was a good idea to present with. Um, and what is the piece? Well, the, the, the piece that I'm working on now is a piece called Talk, T-O-R-C, which is going to be for alto, trombone and violin. And the initial idea came of that uh, was realising that I was uh, able to be in touch with two duos who could actually do an interesting job on this piece. One duo is Mark Menzies, uh, coupled with Matt Barbier, the LA-based trombonist, 
And also uh, in Brisbane, Graham Jennings uh, from Elysian and formerly from the Arditi Quartet, Arditi Quartet and uh, Ben Marks from Elysian. The important point of starting point with that piece is that knowing that three of those four players are also composers and all four of them are also improvisers. Now this, that was part of the, again, the, part of the starting conditions of this thing. Also, when I was daydreaming one day, I had a little vision of a talk. It's like a, basically a kind of bracelet or a neck, uh, like a collar, which is uh, very intricately interwoven in metal. And again, this is not, the piece is not an attempt to do a talk in sound. It's just having something bearing to bear in mind. So ideas of metallic qualities, ideas of being interwoven and spiraling round, and maybe something to do with the form. I don't know yet. I'm still working on this thing. So I had this sort of daydream. What's that thing where it's interwoven? Is it called a talk? So, of course, I went on Wikipedia and checked. And yes, indeed. So that was another sort of starting point. But that's only a sort of referent point. So I have, on the one hand, this sort of vague notion that this is kind of what the piece is about, sort of, maybe. And I have these players. And what am I going to do with these players? Hold on. They're improvisers, too. They're composers. They will be able to grok a lot of what I'm doing. They're used to heavy dots, so in, in that sense I can write what I want for them. I'm not constrained, as I was slightly with Nakashima Burl, because the players in that uh, instance were good players, but good orchestral players, let's say. <laughs> I'll say no more. But it did give a certain kind of uh, contained quality to what I was writing. With the, the piece in, in mind now, this is much more open. But it does open up the possibility, and this is the thing that I have been dwelling on, this is a, the, the observer effect of pre pre preparing for this talk, is to what extent can I hand over some of the material to the players? And that's something I've generally not done very much at all. So I hand over some decision-making or some musical material for the players to work on in a particular way. This is not new, clearly. Many composers have done this, handed certain things over to, to the performers. The question for me is how the hell do I do it? How the hell do I notate it? And to what extent is this given over? Um, I did have a, um, a session with Mark and Matt about a year ago. which was very useful and what it did show to me was with very little instruction with me just doing a few guiding words they were able to come up with some fantastic things and then I was able to in real time say oh could you just add a bit of a sforzando here or could you just put that up an octave or what happens if you do um, a bitone here um, and I'm interested in exploring that more and integrating that with how the notation might work. And that's quite a challenge because there are all kinds of pitfalls of handing over control, making the notation clear, you know, and Mark's laughing at it. Yeah, so there's all those sorts of issues to be dealt with. So to wrap up, um, I guess I'm making a false dichotomy about this difference between the technical and aesthetic because I think um, at the moment... Um, it just makes evident the need to set up some kind of forces in tension, and I think that's really what's going on, that you have to have something to, to push against that, that, that feels like it's pushing you back. And of course, it's both you. Um, why, why do we feel that tension? Well, maybe it comes out in the music. Maybe that's to do with an, an element of creativity. And the observer effect that I'm talking about here today is perhaps just a public enlarged version of something that happens on a smaller private level throughout the entire composition process, this standing back to see what you've done so far, to adopt a position with regard to whatever that is, to choose, reject, and select, and invent. So that's how the observer effect seems to be working on this piece right now. 
But then again, I'm not obliged to follow through with any of that, am I? I could, like a bad politician, simply abandon the idea and deny I ever said this. Thank you. (laughs) 